so my father started farming here in roughly 1980 and um, conventional farming and um, plowing um, in 2001 he changed to mint hill um, we grow a range of crops here we're growing spring barley winter wheat rape beans oats rye and um, spring barley is our main crop um, but in recent years we've started growing a lot more rape and beans with just the fact that beans have become popular in Ireland again in terms of rations and stuff and we're seeing a, a, a growing need for rape for export to the UK with the troubles they're having over there um, in, in terms of growing rape so they're great in terms of break crops, crops after them obviously is, are, are benefited greatly from rape and beans so they have come into it a lot in the last couple of years and um, but spring barley is still our main crop and um, like i said we started being in 2001 um in 2006 we introduced um cover crops into that uh, it was a straight cover crop mustard um, and since then we've kind of grew uh, our late colleague philip reck uh, did a lot of research uh, into cover crops he was um kind of the pioneer of it here and um, in terms of mixes and different different crops different um tillage radish or mustard and combining them and so he's done a lot of work over the last few years on that and we've, we've seen a massive increase in terms of soil biology uh soil health uh, yields and um, nutrient retention and um, just across the board water quality and um, and we're up to stage now here we're doing seven eight way mixes in terms of cover crops and um, to increase biodiversity um it's been a struggle the last two years with, with weather and stuff but um that's like anything um but we have seen a massive massive benefit to this farm in terms of cover crops so with philip's research um he identified which arm would help a germinal actually um what radish or what uh, species were the best for our rotation you see we're growing continuous spring barley in a lot of places and in order to do that the land was kind of getting a bit spun out so you have to kind of rejig the land a bit and the idea of cover crops is that you constantly have something living and breeding in the soil so in terms of if you had compaction issues you'd use the likes of a tillage radish that has a long tap root and grows deep down into the soil but my radish is not um a great host for mycorrhizae so you have to put something with radish to get the mycorrhizae so the likes of a vetch then is a legume that has a massive rooting system and can fix an awful lot of nitrogen so we use that for the legume but also has great mycorrhizae abilities and um, we put facility in again uh, facility is more of like a soil conditioner it conditions the top four inches of the soil so it's like again it's a massive root mass and um, We've used buckwheat. Buckwheat is big for scavenging phosphorus. It makes unavailable phosphorus available into the spring barley crop. Uh, linseed, so sowed linseed last year. It kind of breaks down very slowly and releases carbon very slowly back into the soil. Um, we've used peas. Um, we've used a range of stuff. We've definitely seen, we've reduced nitrogen usage by 10, 15, 20 units. Um, potash by 20 or 30 units in the last three or four years we're indexed three four or four four now in most of our long-term soils and um, diesel consumption has significantly dropped um in terms of our cultivation like we we cultivate with a valor set top down in the case quad track and the soil has become so friable now that there's not this big pull like we know we know we know it's a massive difference when we go from say land that we've had for 10, 15 years into land that we've only had for two years, you would notice a massive difference in pull, if you know what I mean. Um, but the land is just that more friable. So we, we've definitely seen reductions across the board in terms of diesel consumption and fertilizer usage. Definitely to treat it like a crop, not uh, not just, you know, throw it out there, worry about it then in the spring. Like it, it, it should be treated as a second crop. Um, the sown of them is where I think the last two years have been very difficult with straw um, and the weather but we find that you have to get that bit of tilt so we use a other side carrier to uh, to sow our cover crops we use the top down sometimes but we rather use the carrier and we do two to three inches and just get that fine just that little bit of fine clay because all the seeds are very small so they need a lot of seed to soil contact 
So we have been sure to roll every inch of cover crops we sow as well because it's, it's extremely important in terms of seed to soil content to get them going. Plus, when you run the carry, you will mineralize nitrogen and give that give it a little bit of kick at the start. So Philip started measuring carbon here two years ago. Um, it was his idea and. Uh, because we just we heard a lot about carbon and carbon this and the carbon farming so he looked into it first and he measured across the board across all all our acres and he came up with a figure that was we were sequestering 636 kilos of carbon an acre um so we were kind of surprised by this but what we found was the biggest reason for it was the cover crops and the mint hill um and organic matter. Our organic matter has increased anywhere from, it's gone from 3% up to 8% in places um, due to cover crops. We don't import any farm air manure or slurry or anything like that. So it's all been from cover crops that we've increased organic matter. And the higher organic matter you have, the more carbon you sequester. Um, so we looked at all the crops, beans and spring barley were the most environmentally friendly, uh, winter wheat, and the more winter crops, the more kind of high input crops were more the environmentally unfriendly. But when you balance out and you have a good rotation, you will balance the farm. Um, but the most of it can be put down to the mint tail and the cover crops. It seems you'd see in other countries that farmers are selling their carbon credits to big corporations to balance their carbon emissions. So if there is a scheme that comes into place or a company that can buy these carbon credits off you, yeah, I think there's, there's definitely scope for tillage farmers in this country to get an extra few pounds for their carbon. We chopped straw for years and years and years and we kind of went away from it in 2009 roughly. We sort of invested in our own kind of baling, baler slash sheds and rakes and stuff and we kind of went into baling because look at the money was there for it, there's good money for straw and it's kind of there is like there is, there's no doubt there is benefits to chopping straw and the rest of it but you know the there's a lot of money in straw at the moment. The issue with straw the last two years has been trying to get it bailed, um, which in hand, uh, we struggle then with the cover crops, getting the cover crops sown in time, um, which is not simple, but like, you know, right, we can't change the weather. So uh, we see but when you, sometimes when you chop, you get issue with cover crops too, because you get a lot of slugs and the, tend to, the cover crop tends to be slow to germinate. So it's, it's difficult either way, but, um, you get the straw bale and get it off the field and get your cover crops in early. You won't have that issue. So, um, it's 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 a tricky one, really. To be honest.